What's up, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode of the Whirling Astros podcast. We've got Talal Nimi with MI Corporation. Or similar to like MI6. Huh? MI4, yes, it is like <laughs> similar. And you guys have a, a Rig Reports product. Yes. Um, we got introduced recently and super excited about Nerd Now, man. Same Thanks here. for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes. Yeah. So what is it that you guys do? So we're a software company for own gas and we're also a consulting company for okay. own gas. So we, we do consulting and develop software for operators and, uh, we've been around for a while, so we're not really a startup company, but, no. uh, uh, the rig reports, we're treating it as a startup. We're basically yeah. treating it as a whole new, uh, you know, uh, startup company basically. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, it's a uh, drilling software for, you know, drilling reports, workover reports, uh, daily operations reports, basically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we launched it in, uh, January of this year. Yeah. We did a successful six month, uh, uh, private beta first with some of our existing clients. Mm -hmm. And then we launched it in, uh, uh, January of this year. And, uh, it's been, it's been going great. It's been a roller coaster, like it's, you know, very busy, <laughs> uh, adding features every month, you yeah. know, to it. Yeah. And, uh, in one year we, uh, I updated the statistics yesterday to see just how we're doing so far. Cause it's been almost nine months. Mm -hmm. We've drilled over 110 wells in it, uh, and over 650 workovers and, and completions and things yeah. like that. So, so what's the, what's the major, major advantage of like how you guys are doing it versus how, and maybe this is worth explaining how rig reporting and operational reporting is like traditionally done. So um, we're talking here about the daily reports, not the like raw uh, real-time data that comes from the yeah. rig. And traditionally it's either kept track of in, a, in a, a spreadsheet or in a software. And uh, our clients were basically complaining about different pain points, whether they were coming from a, a spreadsheet background or another software. And we tried to solve as many of these pain points as we can uh, to in rig reports. So, one of the biggest uh, issue was the complexity of the software and how difficult it, it can be to use, um, especially since in a typical uh, drilling job, you have um, the company rep or company man coming uh, who doesn't work for the operators. They, you know, they hire them as a consultant. So they're working on different for different companies and they have to use whatever that company has in terms of spreadsheets or software. So they're not repeat users of that software. They don't mm -hmm. have the... Uh, expertise or the muscle memory. And, and so it's not very easy for them to use it. That can make things harder on them. And so they're wasting more time. They don't want to be wasting too much time typing in what they're doing that day. They want to be out there watching that rig. And so we tried to make the software um, as easy as we could make it for the user who's entering data. Um, the, the second issue was that um, the application was just had just way too many things and they only needed to use like maybe 10 or 15% of it at any given time. They didn't really need all to see all those options mm -hmm. and menus. And, uh, as one user put it, uh, he said rabbit holes, he said, I have to go down so many rabbit holes to find what I need. So that's something we try to, you know, we try to simplify. Um, another pain point was that there was a lot of manual, repetitive manual work that needs to be done, uh, like sending the report to stakeholders, and uh, you may have to send multiple copies of the same report, uh, one that has uh, dollar amounts on it, one that does not. So you're sending it to different third parties, one that may have the full detail of the daily operations log and one that just have an executive summary mm -hmm. or uh, like a composite of the daily summary for every day so far on the job, things like that. So those are the main things that we try to um, uh, solve for the user that are visible. Now there are things that are not necessarily visible, but we also, you know, had to solve um, like the applications that have a database and that database, the data model is so complicated that when they, when the user who owns that data tries to look at it, it's very hard for them to understand how to take that data and put it in like a Power BI dashboard or a Spotify dashboard or mm -hmm. even an Excel spreadsheet if they want to make a chart because there's hundreds of tables or, or it's not really truly built as a proper relational database or something like that. Yeah. So uh, we used uh, our existing data platform to, which is very simple and very straightforward and the users can understand it. And uh, as another thing, so the, these are technical things that we're trying to solve. There are other issues that are non-technical, like how we license it and how we price it, but also how we treat 
the data ownership. So uh, one of the things that uh, we believe in is that our clients' data belongs to them. So not only should they be able to see it when they're using our software, they should be able to get it whenever they want in any form that they want, you know. So mm -hmm. if they wanted a full backup every day or if they want a, an API that they can link to it and just be constantly streaming it or, you know, things like yeah. that. We facilitated those things instead of making them uh, obstacles or ex additional costs or something like that. We, we tried to, you know, make it as easy as possible. Yeah. And these things really paid off because the response we've seen from people is that this is different. This is easier. This is, uh, you know, it's giving us everything we need and we don't feel like we're paying for things that we don't need as well when it comes to licensing. Also, licensing, we're not licensing it uh, by user or, you know, things like that. So uh, we use the model that already existed in this space, which is just pay as you go. So if you use it, you pay like a day rate and if you don't use it, you don't, if you're not generating, if you're not drilling or having workovers done, mm -hmm. you don't pay anything, but you can still use the app for all the analytics and all the added, you know. Yeah. And that's another thing, we added a, a lot of analytics built into the app. So we're, uh, we're Power BI shop, we're Microsoft Power BI partners. So we embedded it into the application directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also is a big success with the users. So really the problem was, not only just on the capturing of data, right? And you said it was just so many different options, so many different fields have to be captured, but then also on like, what do we actually do with this data and how do we actually digest it? Right? Yeah, yes. And so, and then the Power BI plays a pretty big Absolutely, part in that. absolutely. To give yeah. you a, a simple uh, example of that, um, if you're an engineer who has to approve invoices and, and after the job is finished, or, you know, if this is a long job and you have, you know, 30 days in, you have to go and approve invoices from a vendor and the invoice, uh, you know, you, you need to verify everything to make sure it's correct. Um, if you if you have to if you have everything in spreadsheets, you have to have a way to collect all that vendor's information from these spreadsheets. Somebody has to be doing it manually, or you have to go through multiple days of reports to to add it up yourself. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in our system, there's just two clicks on a Power BI dashboard, and you see what that vendor's total for that job is. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can slice and dice however you want by category, things like that. Are you guys dealing with the AFEs at all? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So the 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 AFEs. Um, or, uh, Let's just explain what an AFE is, is really quickly. So uh, approval for expenditures, AFE. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to drill you or if you have a workover and uh, you have to budget for it, so you create an AFE, you put a dollar amount on it, and then um, you can just put a big dollar amount on it and leave it at that, or you can go in and itemize it. Say I want to spend, you know, fifty thousand dollars on chemicals, a hundred thousand dollars on, you know, the rig, uh, things like that. Uh, construction, you know, consulting, contracting. Mm -hmm. So once you have your AFE built, then you send it for approval, and and then uh, the job begins, and you start entering daily costs. Uh, every day, your guys, you know, uh, on the job, they're putting in the actual cost uh, tickets as they come in. These aren't the official invoices yet; those come in later. But these are your daily cost field tickets, and uh, as you're putting those in the system, you can track how much you're spending against your budget. Mm -hmm. Are you exceeding the budget? Are you below the budget? You know, what's the cumulative so far per category or per vendor? So these are all things that are calculated uh, in real time and always visible in front of the user yeah. a lot. More, and they don't have to do anything extra, you know, so that's- So are you guys doing the, the routing of the AFEs to any of the working interest partners as well? Not yet, okay. no. That's on our, on our roadmap. Yeah. Uh, so far right now, we create the AFE and we itemize it and we budget it, and we put it in the system and uh on our next uh, iteration right now which is something we're building uh within the next month or so we would have the ability to approve the afe internally for the operator so we're going to begin by routing the afe inside the operator uh, and then later on we might consider you know like uh, because then that opens up the space to third parties and multi-tenants and approvals and things like that so uh, that's a whole other, you know, big, big uh, issue. And we're, we're trying to, we have a lot of stuff on our to-do list that we haven't accomplished yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but like to give you a quick rundown of what we've done so far right now, we have all the uh, drilling workovers, completions, and facility type jobs that we do. Um, and uh, we have a long list of things that we're working on uh, and things that we want to work on. It's a roadmap. We published it. Uh, and the next thing we're building as well is the integration with Teams. 
So we're, we're integrating with Teams and Slack and uh, SMS to send the users information about the job or notifications and alerts and things like that. I love that. So we're, we're a Slack shop. And so we've got tons of automations that are built, whether it's through the website, whether it's through CRM, whether it's through, you know, the marketing software, things like that. Uh, whenever tickets are purchased, we know. So all of that gets into the respective slide channels and then the respective Absolutely. teams yeah. know exactly what's happening, right? Yes. So it's, it is a really good place to kind of just centralize notifications Yes. Uh, and really kind of stay on top of things. And that does make a lot of sense for, especially like the, the drilling reports. A lot of the drilling reports that I've ever seen were essentially, like, like you said, in a spreadsheet and just one gigantic text box that goes on. It's like a massive paragraph of like shorthand. Um, and it's... And unless you really, really know what you're looking at, it's very hard to interpret it. And then it's also not structured, right? You, you, you haven't broken that out into individual fields. Now you have absolutely zero analytics and you can't really understand exactly where, where you're yes, at. Yes, yes. And, and that's, that's why we, the way we build the UI encourages you to have very granular, detailed uh, data entry without a lot of added effort. So mm -hmm. on the same screen, it, uh, you can split it up. You can break it down by 15 minute or one minute increments. And we have some clients that they like to track NPT, non-productive time. Yep. So if they're spending time on the rig and there's there's nothing going on, they want to track it down to the minute. Some companies are, okay, we want to know in general, but others are like, we want to track micro NPT and things like that. So they can do that. Um, and when you have, when you capture all that data and in individual boxes, like you said, now you can run reports and filter based on those uh, boxes. Um, another thing is that um, when, when, when you collect all this data, you can now compare it. So you can say, you know, how's our performance on these jobs compared to the last, you know, 100 jobs that we've done? Uh, why are we spending more time on this type of, you know, why are we slowing down here? Why is the rate of penetration in this field slowing down at the same depth? You know, are we, are we, should we use a different bit or something like that? So th mm -hmm. they can now do analytics because all this data is in one place. Mm -hmm. um, also, since our other products have, you know, there's a production system called Production Here, they're living in the same data platform. So you can say, here's the well, we it went, the well was shut in, we pulled it, we have some corrosion, you know, we, we did a workover, several workovers, and then went back on production. You can see the production and the workovers and the cost and then the changes in production rates and things like that before and after we're bringing in chemical data to, to track the efficiency of different chemical treatments, you know, things like that. So we're trying to include as much information as we can and put it at the fingertips of the clients. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you have some companies that have very strong in-house analytics teams that they just want access to the data because they want to do their own data mm -hmm. science. I mean, you have a lot of spot fire shops, right? Yes. Like, yeah. So we understand that yeah. and we give them a direct SQL database connection. They can have access to everything. Um, other companies, they just want to use the pre pre-made analytics that we have. So we did that as well. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, we're trying to understand what different companies and different cultures like to do and try to make it possible for them. We're not going to say this is a one size fits all kind of thing. Yeah. 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 It's always like, especially when, when you're looking at capturing data, I think that there's always the question of why am I capturing? What am I actually going to do with it? Because I think in the oil field for a long time, it was, let's just capture everything. We'll figure it out later. Right. But then you slow down your entire process of entering this information. And then you, you have all this shit data that you don't even know what to do with. Right. So it's funny that the opportunity here is not in, in building something that's more robust than what's out there. It's building something that's simpler, which in effect yes. is much more effective. Yes, we we and we tried to keep it as simple as possible. Now, uh, pretty much everything we build is built based on what the users tell us. And sometimes, so twenty years ago when I first started, I didn't know as much about the oil and gas industry from a, from a subject matter expertise. So whatever the production engineer tells me to build, I will go out and build it. Now that I know better, and now that I have petroleum engineers on my team and drilling engineers. When they, if somebody asks us for something that doesn't fit in that space that they're asking for it, we have the expertise to question that decision and say, yeah. are you sure this is where you want it to go? Because we think it'll be better off put here and, or, or, you know, or we already have something like that, but you're not looking in the right place or something yeah. like that. So that really matters to keep things simple. Otherwise you end up building a monstrosity to please everyone. And uh, you're hurting everyone by doing that because mm -hmm. now they don't know where to go to find, you know, anything. Yeah. How long have you guys been around now? 
Um, so I started in 99. So we've been around, uh, I established the company in, in the, uh, you know, like uh, towards the end of 99. Was that just so consulting 20, at first? Yes, I started as a consultant. I was building a uh, custom software application for uh, mostly uh, litigation type uh, for, for legal, you know, mm -hmm. for law firms. Um, and uh, in 2004, I started to focus on oil and gas. I got my first, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, client in an oil and gas company. They're still my client, actually, 18 years later. And um, they were having a lot of, they had a lot of manual, repetitive Excel spreadsheet type work. And uh, uh, I automated all of that and converted into like a SQL Server databases for them. And uh, they were also having issues with um, their applications that they were using. Uh, from the big vendors, mm -hmm. didn't have enough reports that, that the way they wanted them. And um, if you're an oil and gas company today and you're buying software from a big vendor and you have, you know, anywhere less than 100,000 barrels a day, they're not going to listen to you. You, you. you may tell them we would like a better report or something like that. And if you're lucky, three months later, you could get, you know, at least that's what I was seeing. So I started by building them uh, analytics based on the applications they already had. And then they didn't like some applications so so much that they asked me to build something. So I built it for them. And then engineers from there started going to other companies and calling us to go. So we started off as, you know, consultants and then started growing the company very slowly, very organically. I was... Um, more focused on understanding this. Once I started working with the oil and gas industry, I really liked it. So I, you know, stopped taking gigs from other industries pretty yeah. much and focus entirely on that. And uh, I was interested in learning the, the the subject matter so I could build better software for them and, and not have to ask a million questions when, when somebody wants something. Um, so my, the first uh, 10 years, I would say, was all in the production field, you know, production, um, some, some AFEs and, you know, allocations, regulatory allocations, mm -hmm. things like that, reporting. Um, and then I started, um, so I launched a uh, production year around 2009. <clears throat> and then about five years later, um, we were building so many, uh, financial type reporting. Really quickly. Uh, what's, what's production year? Let's production year right is, here. is a production software that we, okay. that we have. So if you know this, that's actually how I came into the industry, uh, building essentially production software with GDS where back in 2013 and, uh. Yeah, so a lot of experience there. So let's dive, let's dive into that a little bit. And yeah, we'll absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so what, what, what kind of the capabilities of production? So, <clears throat> production here, of course, it's evolved a lot since yeah, yeah. since it first launched. It handles uh, production, uh, data entry, uh, field data so, capture. So we're putting in, um, say, like uh, tank gauges, yeah, tank well gauges, tests, yeah, uh, run tickets, run tickets, sales, yep. uh, you know, all kinds of things. AFEs, it has AFEs, yeah, um, and it does a ton of reporting based mm -hmm. on that. Uh, and the uh, distribution of reports to partners and, you know, royalty uh, interest owners and things like that. <laughs> so when we built our, um, so essentially we were, it was predominantly a, a production system that we built with GDS where cloud-based um, was kind of getting into the hydrocarbon accounting side, kind of getting into, the vision was that it was going to be like the operating system for an EMP. And it could be like something small, super lightweight in the cloud, get it up. Mm -hmm. We went through on the data capture side. Um, you know, I was working directly with the pumpers just to kind of find something that they would actually use. Right. Cause like you said, like these guys, a lot of these guys were contract pumpers. And so they're working for three, four, 10 different companies. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, they have to go and enter all the gauges in. And a lot of times it's not even them entering them in. It's like their daughters or their wives or somebody else. Who, uh, yep. Like, yep. I mean, I know that's changed now because a lot of the pumpers that I've interacted with are much younger, but like back oh. when we were operating, our pumper was 82 years old. Like, could barely understand how to like use a cell phone. And so like we went through so many different iterations on the field data capture side to find something that was very similar to what they were used to using, which was like Excel essentially. And so in the, um, on, on the web platform, it essentially looked like a very dynamic version of Excel that you couldn't fuck up really. And if you did, there was data validation. We built thresholds in right to where if you put in without a, without a run ticket being in there, say it went from, you know, eight foot, four inches down to six foot, three negative inches. Production. Yeah. It would show negative production. So it would highlight the whole thing red. Yes. So you couldn't like fat finger. Absolutely. Right? Uh, yeah. And so there was a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, we went through like seven different versions and that's what it ended up looking like. Essentially just like a very dynamic spreadsheet that had conditional 
cells that would just light up based on whether you actually enter the stuff. And it also, if it was like, if way higher than what the tank capacity even was, like they would also kind of like show things like that sure. too. But yeah. so you just described production here basically, which yeah. is very similar to what yeah. we, yeah. Um, the way it started, that first, that very first production year customer, um, they had about uh, maybe 25 fields mm -hmm. spread out over Texas and Louisiana. And like you said, mostly pumpers giving the data either to uh, uh, someone, a clerk in the field office, yeah. because they had like- Literally, maybe, like here's my gauge book. Yes, like, a hard copy. Yeah, punch yeah. all this in for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Or they would go sit on a computer or hand it over to someone to enter it for them. And uh, then they would send all these spreadsheets to the main office. Someone at the main office would then co collate all these spreadsheets into one master spreadsheet that had all the fields in it. And each spreadsheet that's coming from these field offices was not, they, they were not all standardized. So some of them had more rows than columns than others and things like that. Sometimes you'd have formula issues and someone had to do a lot of work to make it all add up into a daily total report for the company owners or, or a monthly report for, you know, to do allocations off of and things like that. So this is where we came in and uh, they had at the time purchased a software that uh, would solve this problem for them. And they spent maybe three months uh, onboarding and training and installing and customizing and everything. So since this was 2004, uh, they had to use Citrix. If you remember Citrix Remote Connections, because everything ran in the office. That's how a, everybody was pitching on cloud a server. Yeah, before cloud was a yeah. thing, it was like, yeah. oh, you'll just remote in. It's the mm -hmm. cloud. And it's like, well, kind of, but not really. Yeah. And all the users and all the fields had this similar looking user interface for them. It's like a cookie cutter. Yeah. Here's I'm pretty sure here's I, the screen you have to enter data I'm in. I'm pretty sure IHS's old products. What was it? Um, uh, Field Direct. Yeah, Field Direct yeah. and then Production Explorer. Yeah. Were both what, with Citrix and previous yes. Citrix Remote. In so this was from a, from a different vendor, but it was very similar to that. Yeah. Now here's the problem. First, they had to learn a new user interface that had way more columns and buckets than they, than they needed. Second, they would get on Citrix, they would enter half the data on a dial-up from somewhere in Louisiana, for example, and halfway in, they will lose the connection and have to start over because everything's gone. Mm -hmm. The frustration, I've heard some colorful language over these phone calls, they were so frustrated. <laughs> Did y'all look, look to do anything with local storage and uh, solve that for well, the connectivity issues? They, they called the vendor. Yeah. I was there. I was yeah. there doing SQL stuff for them. So yeah. they called the vendor and sat me down with them, and and they brought in the vendor. And so this was, of course, another thing that I was always not a fan of is these applications change hands, and you mm -hmm. lose so much support and for knowledge whenever people sell it. And yeah. so this was a product that this big vendor had bought from another company in Canada, and they brought in. Developers were still there. Brought them in, sat them down with the client. What what is the problem? How can we fix it? Long story short, they couldn't fix the problem. Uh, so they asked me to build them a very simple replacement and they nixed that product, they returned it. They were within the you know 90 days that they had to, to return it. Is that product still around anymore? Uh, yeah, it's got a different name now though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then the, the funny thing is that they said, can you do it in three months? And I said, well, uh, I'll try. I love a challenge. I get more excited when something is challenging. So, Like what's your budget? <laughs> yeah. So um, I literally just sat down day and night and I, and I built them uh, a SQL Server database that collected all the data in a very standard database model based on what they've explained to me. Mm -hmm. But the front end that I built, because it had to be fast, was an access database, if you're familiar with Microsoft Access. Forever ago. But, but every field had their own... Uh, user interface screen mm -hmm. that looked exactly like their spreadsheet they're used to seeing. Yeah. So adoption was a no-brainer. Everybody loved it from day one. And uh, we did not use uh, Citrix for that, right? So because we had local databases and we just synchronized everything mm -hmm. to the main office. And about, uh, that was before production here. That was something custom for that one company. But then others heard about it and they wanted to see it. And so I started thinking about building a more SaaS product. Production here was a cloud application in 2009 when nobody else was you know, really mm -hmm. doing that yet. Truly a cloud application, where it's just a, a click once desktop application. How, that, I remember how hard it was to sell it back then, because I remember even in 2013, I'm going to companies 
go to these, you know, mid-size EMPs. And I was like, yeah, we, we, you know, we do, we do this in the cloud. And they're like, mm -hmm. all right, well, what's the cloud? Mm -hmm. No, well, the biggest question was, you know, uh, how do I trust that my data is not going to disappear and I want my data here in-house? Yeah. But it was like, you do online banking, you do all, you do Absolutely. all of the other things. Absolutely, yes. And you're worried about this. You're worried of. about production data, which is at the end of the day, it's public data. It ends up being on the Railroad Commission's yeah. website. So yeah. like you said, we're just talking about, we're talking about 10 cages, talking mm -hmm. about run tickets, shit like mm -hmm. that. Like, so... What I had to do at, at, first, at first, and I still did that for, for a few clients until recently, uh, give them a full backup of their database on a schedule to make sure that they have this comfort of having their entire database backed up yeah. on their system. And some of them actually use that backup to feed their Spotfire dashboards and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so that was uh, production. And then it, it basically just grew into a lot more. So um, we started importing budgets from accounting systems and creating... Uh, uh, the AFEs they were entering field tickets on a daily basis, so they could track uh, cost versus budget for operations mm -hmm. on a real time. B before they didn't have that ability, field tickets would be mailed in or like you know faxed in or something like that. Do you feel like Do you feel like a lot of the EMPs these days are are content with the accounting systems on the market today? So accounting software, that's a very big question. Because you've only got really yeah. a few players. Yes. Most of them have been around for a long time. Yes, and they're they're also like getting less because like... Uh, yeah. Well, it's one of the hardest things to get off of, right? Imagine imagine you build something entirely oh. new. It solves everybody's problems. People but, would quit if you tell them, I'm changing yeah. your... Yeah, I'm changing like, your entire yeah, accounting yeah, system and yeah. ripping that out. It's like, it's, yeah. yeah, you're, you're yeah. 100% right. So, you lose people over that. So but at the same time, it's... I mean, some of these are so antiquated, so old. Absolutely. The, the, the one that I'm most familiar with, because that's the one that most of my clients use, was OGSIS. Yeah. And then, and now it's acquired by by Quorum. So there's, there, there's less and less companies now that are offering this type you've got, of- uh, You've got those guys, you've got Wolfpack, you've mm -hmm. got- um, Inertia. P2, yeah, P2's got some Inertia. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of small ones. So there's one called Integra. Yeah. 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 So so, so uh, my biggest beef with-, with not just accounting, but mostly accounting packages is that it's very hard for the clients to get the raw data. So if they wanted to export their GL or they want to export their budget or something like that, they have to, you know, run through hoops to, to, and some of them don't even use like a SQL database, like an open database. They would use something like Wolfpack, for example, does uses something proprietary, right? So you can't really- They have their own proprietary database? Uh, it's not, I don't think it's their own. I think it's a, a database engine that they license from someone, but it's mm -hmm. proprietary. And they did- I think at some point switch to SQL Server or mm -hmm. try to switch to SQL Server. I'm not sure, but because of that, you can't just do an ODBC connection and like a Power BI dashboard or a Spotfire dashboard directly into there, or to pull from there to feed a more analytical model that makes more sense analytically or a data warehouse. Uh, but uh, some companies, what they did, they would sell you like a, or offer a a connector. So it's like an ODBC connector, but it's custom for them. And they're not always perfect. You have to, you know, whereas OGIS is what I liked about it is that for the longest, uh, for many years now, uh, they've been on a SQL, proper SQL Server database. Anyone can open up SQL Server Management Studio mm -hmm. and look at all the tables. And because we do get questions sometimes uh, from accounting, it's like, you know, something doesn't look right on this report and, you know, someone must have booked something wrong or something like that. It is so easy when you can just run a query and, and show that, yes, you know, they booked, a, you know, an entry mm -hmm. to the wrong account and then they reversed it and then booked it correctly. But then when they reversed it, they didn't include the same AFE number. So now one has an AFE number, one doesn't have an AFE number. So they're showing up in different places. You know, that, why yeah. am I seeing a negative value here? That kind of yeah. thing. So when you can run a quick query against a database just to read, we're not we're not gonna go in there and mess with the with the accounting database. That's a big no no. It's just a read only thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so um, after production, you need to kind of you know get you there because we did so much with accounting uh, uh, reporting. We created a product called Pendulum, which is a, a strictly financial reporting. Basically, replaced all the financial reporting that operators were doing out of their accounting software, mm -hmm. recreated everything for them. So nothing has changed. They still got their same reports that they had before, but they got them quicker. And these are interactive reports that they can s interact with and slice and dice and you mm -hmm. know things like that. Yeah. Are you doing all that in Power BI? Uh, no, actually uh, we do s some of it in Power BI. Yeah. The, the majority of the reports, uh, we use SQL Server report services, okay. which is a very powerful report engine. And it has the capability to distribute reports and send them to people. And the reports are web-based reports that are interactive and 
mobile friendly and, mm-hmm. and all kinds of things. So. What are your thoughts on something like a, an unstructured database, like a MongoDB? Do you feel like there's applications in yeah, this space? There's definitely applications for it, especially uh, when when you're trying to collect uh, unstructured data. Like uh, I'm, I'm currently helping a, a client on a consulting project that has MongoDB built in. But uh, um, so IoT data and sensors, and they're trying to deploy many different types of sensors and all these sensors will send you um, J- JSON packets that has uh, different, uh, you know, different attributes. So one sensor may be sending you 10 different temperature readings. Another one could be sending 15 temperature readings and 10 pressure readings and things like that. We're talking like a big compressor that has tons of sensors or something yeah. like that. Um, y- you can't really build a relational database easily to track this data in a proper table and column and rows because you don't know what the number of columns is going to be. And uh, what I've seen some companies do is they build like, you know, they just use, uh, they obfuscate the columns. So they have column one, column two, column three, and they will build like a hundred columns and use them for different things. And we don't, we don't do that. Of course, we want the users to look at it and understand where it is. So in those cases, a NoSQL database would be great. And then you can extract those attributes if you need them and put them in a, proper tabular form for, you know, reporting and things like that. But to capture that, especially when it's being streamed in real time and, you you know, you want to save it with minimal latency and not have to do any transformations until later and things like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really um, useful. So production years still around, still blowing and going, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And absolutely. then uh, when, when did rig reports come around? Rig reports came out uh, 2022. Uh, we... Uh, Officially, version yeah. one. Okay. We started in uh, mid of 2021 with the beta testing and, and private previews and things like that. Mm-hmm. So officially, it's been around for nine months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so this is probably something that just came from clients. They were just like, yes. this is one of our massive pain points. Nobody's really, yes. as far as I know, there's really, outside of this, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that just solely, specifically ta- tackles um, like drilling reports. There are a few applications are out there? there. Yes, yes, there are. And, and, and those were the ones that some of our clients were using. And uh, so they came. Are we talking us. about some like the like the well views? So well view is a big one. Yeah. Uh, but it does so much more than just what rig reports is designed for. And and one of the complaints was that the users. It's very uh, complex. It's very complex. Yeah. So they end up only using a portion of it, and not the, not the whole thing. You know. No. And I think if if I, if I remember correctly, and this could have changed. I haven't opened well view in forever, but it was like really designed to where you you had to use all of it, and if you didn't, then a lot of the functionality really didn't work. I'm not too familiar with it, but I've I've heard you know complaints that it's so big and it's so hard to find you know wh- everything that we want in one place kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's there's a couple of other ones out there. Uh, one of their one of the main complaint about some of them is that um, to go talk to back about to, to go back to the uh, database model. Some of these applications um, were built. In basically in a way that, like I said, you have one massive table and it had tons of columns in it because different companies wanted to look, make their reports look differently. So to accommodate that, they said, we're going to have just this one big massive table and column one may be, you know, tubing pressure for me, but it could be casing pressure for you. Yeah. So there's no, or between one field and another field in the same company, there may be different layouts that are mapped differently to the same table. So that's really not a proper relational database model and you can't run a query. And so because of that, you have symptoms like, um, if I wanna run a query or a report or a dashboard that shows me, uh, you know, what was the rate of penetration at, you know, this depth or something like that across all the wells we drilled in this field, that's impossible for them to do that because every job itself is a silo is like a black box and you cannot do cross job reporting or look backs or even on the same well multiple jobs in history mm-hmm. or across multiple wells you know if you have a group of wells you know you want to you want to analyze them all together yeah. and that's very important and we've gotten to the point where now we have clients that are planning 15 wells they're drilling 15 wells in the same area and they're all identical like they're all going to you know, the only difference is that they're just not in the same location. So not only do we have this really nice and simple database model that they can mm-hmm. uh, leverage to, to get more analytics from, we also give them the ability to clone stuff. So for example, if you do your days versus depth planning and, and your planning is pretty much the same for all these wells, we can just clone it. And you say, here's my, I want to just borrow from this well and repeat and plan 15 wells. And maybe I'll change a little bit for each one. 
but now you don't have to re-enter all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So back to saving time and you yeah. know, things like that. So that's that's these are the things that we spend a lot of time doing because they at the end of the day they make it easier for the user. They they save time and they like the application, so they have you know no reason to go look for another one. You know? So are so are you guys getting into the um, into like the well planning set of things? Not yet. That's yeah. that's on our that's on our roadmap. Okay. Uh, but uh, this feature, for example, the days for first step. If you were, you can, so the, the planning aspect isn't there yet. For example, like showing you on a Gantt chart and on a day by day to, so that you can schedule your rigs and collaborate with the rig company. These are things that we plan on doing. Right now you can go in there and, and create mm -hmm. uh, 15 future jobs. And you only have to enter like the days versus death planning for one of them or the budget and then clone it and reuse it. So yeah. we have cloning and, and carry forward and things like that pretty much everywhere to make it very quick and easy to redo something instead of having to re-enter it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your roadmap, but first I want to talk about what opportunities do you see? I mean, having been in the trenches the last 20 years, what opportunities do you see that are not like things that you guys are not going to pursue? You know, we talked about the whole accounting side of is there any other opportunities you feel like are kind of like gaping holes, but it's like, it's not y'all's wheelhouse. You're not going to get into building it, but like for anybody else who's listening, who's like, oh yeah, like maybe, I, maybe I'd love to pursue something. I just want to give other entrepreneurs like some other ideas. Accounting. You just the accounting. accounting side, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people that I've talked to have, you know, pretty much shared the same opinion that <clears throat> there's no uh, truly um, user-friendly oil and gas accounting SaaS, you know, cloud application out there. Some companies tried to and didn't have a lot of success. Uh, so were all of them on-prem? No, no, not necessarily. I mean, some okay. of them would have a, you know, a cloud offering in terms, you know, or, or a web-based mm -hmm. uh, user interface. But then when you look at it, it really looks like they took the desktop user interface and now they made it, they serve it to you in a web browser. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when, when we built rig reports, we put everything we know about, uh, the design from, from our previous experience away. And we decided to look at what the best performing SaaS products in other industries, you know, we're talking about like HubSpot and other type of application, yeah. everything, what's so successful about them, whether it's from the user experience, UX, or whether it's from the, uh, how they offer them, you know, like a transparent pricing, uh, simple, you know, easy to understand pricing models and user interfaces, open APIs, Things like that. Uh, this is what I think would make the product successful because the oil and gas industry is accustomed to having uh, complex pricing models by user, you know, very expensive, no. um, separate, like more support you have to pay for separately and things like that. Uh, so these are things that I think there's there's room for, for someone, uh, you know, a startup to come in there and really uh, disrupt the, the, the yeah absolutely ad. I think particularly on the pricing side I think you're 100 right I think that because we've seen I mean I think we subscribe to probably 30 SaaS tools that we pay for every single month uh, at varying kind of prices but the simpler you you make that the more likely you are to be able to add in like say it's like per seat for example the easier that is the more seats that we're going to add yes we had literally just had this conversation prior to us kind of popping in here but also things like I, mean, we're, I love that you mentioned the uh, the HubSpot analogy, yeah, but like, what can you yeah, what can you pull from other industries that's been successful from the UI, from the UX perspective, um, whether it's from pricing, whether it's from positioning, and how can you apply that to kind of your existing products? Um, onboarding, like right now, if you look at applications and and you're you're a new user, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to buy this software, how easy is it for you to buy it? You have to you have to sit through a demo. You have to talk, you know, to sales to give you a quote, uh, and then when you sign that quote, you still have maybe anywhere between a week to a month or more before you can actually start to use that software, right? And I know what goes into it, especially with like production year, where you ha we have to, you know, create allocations for them and things like that, or convert all their historical data. So what we did differently with understanding the, the scope of this project, yes. yeah. And with rig reports, we are now onboarding new clients the same day. And my goal is for the whole process to be completely self-service autom automated. And, yeah. and we're getting close to, to being there. Uh, uh, 
based on what our competitors of rig reports are saying, the the shortest period is like a, a seven day onboarding. And it really matters. You, you may say seven days is not that long. Um, so we're targeting with rig reports uh, operators as our clients, but also we have uh, drilling consultants as our clients. We mm -hmm. have a few drilling consultants that are using it. And because they like the repeatability, they go to different operators and they use the same software and they send these reports to the operators. Another thing we did with rig reports is that the 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 cost per report is jibbable. So at the end of the job, the operators receive a, a, a detailed breakdown so that they can share that with their interest owners so that yeah. they don't pay for the whole thing themselves. Um, but uh, with the with the consultants being a client, consultants usually are moving around and they're very busy and they go from job to job. We get a call, hey, I have a new operator and we're spotting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if it's a repeat customer, like they've already, they know what to send us. Here's their chart of accounts and uh, here's the list of users. And within an hour or two, they're up and running, yep. right? That's where the true benefit, like to them, why would they go with anyone else? If mm -hmm. This is the most yeah. uh, convenient. You're making, it, you're making it so easy. So, so convenient for them. them, yeah. What's the what's the vision for you guys say, like, like where, where are you guys at in, in, in three years in terms of the product? So... Um, there's there's a really big uh, to do on our on our roadmap, which is uh, we're, we're part of the OSDU. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with the OSDU. So uh, we want uh, first. Let me back up a little bit. Um, one of the things that I kept hearing is uh, these vendors have like five different products. Why do I have to buy this and that? And you know why can't I just buy it all as as one package? Right. Another thing people say uh, since you mentioned you know IHS. If, if you had a production production year equivalent, you have to buy sometimes um, the field data capture application mm -hmm. and an allocation application and then a reporting application. You know, When I did production year, we kept it as all as one application yep. that does everything, right? So to keep things simple, since all of our applications are built on the same data platform, which means all the data for the operator is living in one place and you can see all of it, um, I just recently like uh, talked about this on LinkedIn. Just it's still very, very you know the ink hasn't dried yet. Uh, we're we're creating a new platform. We're calling it WellOps, okay. and that's going to include everything we do. So it's a all in one, easy to you know. We have one customer already testing it and loving it. The simplicity of having everything in one place, and the second one we just you know started the paperwork on it like yesterday. Uh, we haven't uh, finalized that deal yet, but. The, um, the idea here is, you know, if you want to use all these products, let's not uh, try to negotiate three different things. We're, we're going to keep it simple. Here's a per well pricing scales. So if you're very small, you pay very little, you just use what, what you need. And as your, as your company grows, you know, you're licensing it per well. So you can have all your users, all your third parties, you know, the chemical companies, or everyone can use it and doesn't cost you anything more. So that's where we're going with this. And I've always been an advocate of data availability and not um, not holding the data hostage, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we when when I found out about the OSDU and what they were doing, I immediately let's, let's explain what the OSDU is real quick. So the OSDU uh, is a um, stand it stands for uh, Open Subsurface Data Universe, but it's it's no longer just for subsurface. It's for all energy type data. It's an organization. Uh, it's uh, created by the uh, Open Group OSDU Forum, and uh, mm -hmm. we joined the forum as a member company. The forum uh, and, and then how how does that compare to PPDM? It's uh, uh, it's not the same. Uh, is it a totally different standard? Yeah. Like it's, trying, to, it's, trying to accomplish the same things with different standards? It's actually, it uses some of the standards like PPDM and WITSML and things like that because there's a lot of collaboration going on with these other standards organization. But, um, and I think that, uh, you know, the OSDU, they have a lot of material on their website that you can see. But um, the organization is consists of member companies that are uh, operators, uh uh, all field service companies and software vendors, all and cloud providers. So the aim is to create a, a technology agnostic data platform uh, that's also vendor agnostic, which is great because now as an operator, it solves two major problems for you. First, if you're acquiring or selling fields uh, or assets, you can now transfer that data to other to the purchaser or the seller. So so it's no longer a hassle to convert 
from one system to another system. You mm -hmm. know, if we're using a software and you're using a different software, it's a huge process and so much gets lost and, and you know, translation and it takes time and things like that. Second, you don't have vendor lock-in. So you don't feel that oh, we, we don't like this software, but we can't leave it because all of our data is in it. If your data lives on this platform, which you can host it in-house or you can host it in any of the big cloud providers, then you can use application A or application B. And, and you know, and, and I think that is great because it encourages vendors to be more competitive and add more features to, to maintain mm -hmm. customers instead of just counting on the pain of uh, conversion as a, <laughs> as a way to retain, you know, customers. Yeah. So like in, in all of our tools, I never enforced long-term contracts. Everything was month to month because I felt that if I'm losing clients because they don't like my application, I will have to make it better. So I wish more people thought that way. Um, and and this is a way for me to challenge us as well to make yeah. sure that we are we know we're doing the right thing and we're doing a, we have a good product, you know. So um, for us to put our products on the OSU platform, that's a big goal that I you know hope that we can achieve. So we're not there yet. We're you know, but but we're, we're we've been a member and you know trying to keep up with all the uh, you know changes that are going there. Man, this is exciting. It's cool to hear just how much experience you have in this space and truly just listening to listen to your customers and listen to that community and and really building solutions. And it's it's so easy to see that you actually care, which is refreshing kind of in the in the in particularly in the production space, right? Where you've just got a lot of legacy products. Um, I remember back in the day when I was trying to get, I would, I would try to do these conversions from from IHS onto onto our software, and it was like you you realize that that on the, on the production Explorer and the, um, uh, field direct, it was like, they only had like two people working on that product, like to support every single one of their existing legacy customers getting off. It was awful. And we asked about an API integration. She was just like, Oh honey, we've got the, we've got the API numbers listed here. And I was like, that's not what I was talking about. So it is refreshing to see that you're actually caring about the customers and, and providing solutions that's really going to make a huge impact in, in their business. So thank you. Anybody that's listening, where can they go to, to find out more about whether it's, you know, rig reports, what's production year or Yale's consulting services? Uh, the best place is mi4.com, okay. our website. And uh, with rig reports, since we're treating it as a startup and yeah. actually we're, you know, I've got to mention we're using the, uh, we're working with the Evolve Village who introduced us yeah, to yeah. you as a, uh, rigreports.com is, is the website where you okay. can go and, and, you know, we're, there's, there's videos they can watch. Yep. You know, things like that. You awesome. Know, they and can you're sign on LinkedIn too. So yes. If you have, on LinkedIn. must reach out to you directly there. Yes, directly on LinkedIn. Rig reports as well as on LinkedIn. Awesome, man. Well, I'm excited. Yeah. Let's oh. do, uh, we'll do, we'll do a checkup in a, in a year or so, see where you guys are at. That sounds great. Thanks for, thanks for making it in.